surgery to remove an alien implant caught on tape. A flying saucer fragment found. UFO landing sites located. All the work of a special breed of investigator. I've seen an overwhelming amount of physical evidence. I'm absolutely convinced that UFOs are real. These real-life X-Filers believe the truth is out there, and their goal is to discover if science fiction may actually be science fact. They are UFO hunters. The job of a UFO hunter is the quest for ultimate truth. They seek proof that we are not alone in the universe. They present evidence that we are being visited by beings from other worlds. But does proof of such visits exist? And if so, would that change people's opinions of UFOs and UFO hunters? In 1985, one man, Bob White, claimed that he'd found a fragment of a UFO. I was traveling from Denver to Las Vegas with a young lady named Jan. And uh, in the high desert, if it's a bright, clear night and the stars are shining, which it was, you could see forever. I was asleep when she woke me up and asked me what this strange light was. I didn't know. So I stayed awake and we watched it. As we got closer to the light, it got bigger. We stopped the car to look at it. The light was so bright, I had to shield my eyes like this to look at it. She turned the headlights on for some reason. When she did this thing, just shot up in the air that fast. And when it got up in the sky, it connected to another light, and then this object was ejected from it. When I first saw it, it was glowing red, and it just looked like a glob of something. And it was too hot to touch. My first thought was, what in the world could it possibly be? What could this be? Once the object cooled, White placed it in the trunk. What you are seeing is the actual object White recovered. This is what it looked like after it cooled down. The only difference is the end piece on here was rounded and that was cut off for an analysis by Los Alamos. The jagged fragment measuring nine inches in length and weighing over a pound and a half was subjected to isotopic ratio and other elemental composition tests at the US government's Los Alamos National Laboratory. After several weeks of testing, White finally talked to a technician. He was very excited about it. He said, this is definitely extraterrestrial. It's something I've been looking for all my life. And I said, that's wonderful. So I told newspaper columnist Mike O'Brien that uh, he called and talked to the same scientist. And the same scientist told him that he didn't say that. And he said, my bosses have instructed me not to talk to anyone about this. And that was the end of the conversation. Los Alamos would not return phone calls or respond to inquiries for this program regarding the unusual sample. White sent the object to eight different labs, including MIT, New Mexico Tech, and Scripps Laboratories. While they all concluded that the complex structure was mostly aluminum, White feels that its origin may have been revealed in the results of one of the tests. One that I consider to be the most important was done by a uh, scientist that was on a team of scientists that found a meteorite in Antarctica and they found a meteorite in India. And they measured the isotopes in strontium and determined that they were from Mars. Well, the same people that did the analysis on those things did the analysis on the object that I have. And the measurement falls right in between the two from uh, Mars. Another anomalous fragment, nearly identical to White's, was found some 40 years earlier. The story was confirmed by declassified U.S. government documents. They have an object almost identical to this one that was recovered by the CIC 
the counterintelligence corps in the 1940s in Denmark. And their words, not mine, their words, is as a piece of a flying saucer. In 2004, White passed three separate polygraph tests administered by both law enforcement officers and a certified polygraph examiner to further authenticate his claim. But still, he found no help getting his story out. The journey drained his savings and his spirit. I didn't ask for this to happen to me. I didn't need this. Didn't want it. Didn't want people to call me a UFO nut. And I didn't even believe in anything like this. But once you see it, once it happens to you, you have to be a believer. Bob White's quest for the truth defines the modern-day UFO hunter. But what exactly does that mean? The term UFO hunter is a rather peculiar one because it covers an awful lot of ground. You can hunt sightings, you can hunt people, you can hunt documents. For me, it's a combination of those plus hunting an audience to talk to. In the past, I've tried to focus on the government cover-up. And we'll talk about the FBI, the CIA, the Air Force, the NSA. I'm convinced that this whole question of alien visitations is the biggest story of the millennium. And Stanton Friedman would know. A nuclear physicist from the University of Chicago, he has spent more than 40 years in the UFO field. Friedman is considered one of the most knowledgeable UFO hunters. A relentless pursuit of the truth and a passion for answers is the link between the UFO hunters of today and those of yesterday. Are UFOs real? Was a question frequently asked by the man regarded as the original UFO hunter, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. J. Allen Hynek is indeed the godfather of, uh, of UFO research. This man had more experience, more knowledge, and more contacts in the field of uh, UFO research than anyone and I suspect more than anyone ever will have. J. Allen Hynek was an astronomer with Northwestern University. And uh, early on, when Project Blue Book had been set up by the US government, they had hired J. Allen Hynek as a, their scientific consultant. Project Blue Book was developed in 1947 by the US Air Force to scientifically investigate the UFO riddle. Heineck was its chief civilian consultant, and he went in as a skeptic. To this time, there is no proof that I would consider valid scientific proof that we have been visited by spaceships. Heineck eventually realized that he was not given full access to the data. One example of this is the investigation of the 1968 UFO sighting over Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. He was asked by the Air Force to go there and investigate the case. And when he arrived in North Dakota, he was prevented from talking with the witnesses. So it was the fact that some of the cases, the very good cases, were indeed going somewhere else. After 21 years of working with the government, Hynek's opinion on the reality of UFOs changed. With Project Blue Book ending, Hynek concluded that there was need for further study of the UFO phenomena. UFO hunter John Schusler agreed. He co-founded the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, which continues today to investigate UFO sightings. Well, the Mutual UFO Network began because there was no place for people to report UFOs. We became a reporting spot. Schusler and Heineck garnered respect in the UFO community. However, another UFO hunter emerged from the University of Arizona's Institute of Atmospheric Physics, who used his credentials as a scientist to revolutionize the way his colleagues viewed UFOs. Before James McDonald entered our field publicly, the scientific community was completely ignoring uh, the UFO phenomenon. McDonald was the first prestigious scientist to openly declare his interest in this phenomenon. He startled his colleagues because uh, scientists at that time did not go public with any interest in UFOs. It, um, it was a no-brainer, shall we say. Ann Druffel has been investigating UFOs for more than 57 years. She has uncovered Dr. James McDonald's personal journals and has written the only biography of McDonald titled Firestorm. He gave hundreds of talks to scientific groups on UFOs and he, he would uh, express in his journal that he had 
uh, concentrated it on the fact that the UFO phenomenon was a serious scientific problem. He was the top hunter, shall we say. <laughs> Jim McDonald, because he was so convinced that this was a major subject, managed to get a congressman to sponsor hearings back in 1968. Six scientists testified in person, including McDonald and Hynek, and six more of us submitted written submissions only. Following the example set by McDonald was UFO hunter Dr. Frank Drake, a professor of astronomy at Cornell. Drake helped create one of the most recognized names in the study of life in the universe, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or SETI program. The SETI program looks at the issue of are there planets around other stars, and if so, then what is the easiest way for them to communicate with us? With radio telescopes worldwide, SETI searches the skies for radio waves from other intelligent life in the universe. Dr. Rudy Schild, research scientist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, believes that SETI has its flaws. In my view, SETI is an approach taken by people who are very smart and who think that they understand alien technology well enough to be able to exploit it and to give us direct evidence of alien civilizations. Whereas UFO hunters are people who are also smart, but doing the obvious thing that we always do when we see something we can't understand. We get out our cameras, our Geiger counters, and whatever we've got, and just make observations. And I congratulate the UFO hunters because I think they're gonna get there first. Have UFO hunters finally found a smoking gun? Proof of alien life here on Earth or even under the sea? And later, are humans being abducted and tracked by aliens? Exclusive footage of a surgery to remove alien implants may just change your mind about UFOs. These objects contain metals which are not from this Earth. April 24th, 1964, Socorro, New Mexico. Police officer Lonnie Zamora witnesses an oval object on four legs with two humanoids less than 100 feet away in broad daylight. The object quickly ascends, leaving burnt bushes and four imprints on the ground. Two days later, a nearly identical object is witnessed 150 miles away in La Madera, New Mexico. Both cases are investigated by the original UFO hunter, J. Allen Hynek, and his student, Ted Phillips. I did start out as a skeptic, and I was kind of a convert after Socorro, New Mexico. There were four imprints in the ground where the landing legs had gone in, um, and some small, what appeared to be footprints. And, uh, and this, this is truly one of the, the good cases, the very good cases. We have looked at the work of Ted Phillips for years. We have respected what he's done. He's a person that, uh, before it was popular, went out and started collecting evidence of landings of UFOs, what he called landing trace effects. This is physical evidence that something's going on. As a UFO hunter, my job really is simply to gather the hard evidence uh, to support UFO sightings. Over the past 36 years, I've been involved with or personally investigated uh, somewhere around 600 cases. Because of the amount of trace evidence, the Socorro, New Mexico case was a turning point for many UFO hunters, including J. Allen Hynek. Alan talked about this case. He told me later that he began to see that something, in fact, was taking place because this was a daylight sighting by a police officer with other witnesses and the finding of physical traces at the landing site. So this is why then, four years later, he suggested to me to specialize in landing cases especially with physical evidence um, for the simple reason that uh, you can look at a million lights in the sky and it produces really nothing except a million reports of visual observation. 
Dr. Honig always suggested that people specialize. Ted listened, and he did specialize, and that's why he became so well known for trace effect investigations. To this day, the Socorro landing is still listed in government files as unexplained. Phillips' archives are filled with cases that he calls significant. Significant case would be one in which we have multiple witnesses, good seeing conditions, close range, plenty of time for the individuals to figure out what they're looking at, and uh, resulting uh, physical residue of some kind. In other words, the object is at that site and it generates physical traces on the plants, on the soil, uh, tree damage, it uh, can go several ways. Some of the cases he's investigated couldn't have been done in normal ways. You couldn't have faked it, for instance. It had to be something unusual, unconventional. It flew in, landed, uh, it actually changed the environment, and then it left. I believe that we're dealing with constructed devices under some kind of intelligent control. And that's based on the data, the facts, period. While Phillips may lead the way in land investigations, other UFO hunters are looking to the sea. Considering the fact that water covers about 70% of our planet, a significant part of the UFO research occurs at sea. UFO hunter Paul Stonehill has spent more than a decade examining declassified Soviet documents that detail such sightings. When the Soviet Union started disintegrating, I decided to uh, form a so-called uh, Russian uh, UFO Research Center to be a bridge between uh, Soviet ufologists and their American counterparts. The Soviets knew that there were objects and phenomena that they could not explain, grasp, or capture. So they wanted to study it. Some of the most interesting cases took place in 1960s and 70s when Soviet submarine commanders would encounter gigantic objects chasing them deep waters. Huge objects would ascend from the ocean. Cigar-shaped objects would hover over Soviet ships, observe, move about at great speeds. Stonehill specializes in what researchers call USO encounters. A USO is unidentified submersible object. A UFO is unidentified flying object. The Soviet military intelligence, and especially naval intelligence, had been very much interested in the USOs simply because they wanted to assess the threat presented. They had examples, even back in 1982, for example, in Lake Baikal, when local commanders tried to capture one of the so-called gigantic swimmers. Machinery was destroyed. People died. Human beings died while trying to capture the unknown phenomenon. And the Soviet high command decided not to lose any more people. There was nothing they could do about the so-called observers. It's not easy to study the UFO and USO phenomena uh, as it pertains to the Soviet Union and Russia. Secrecy has always been in fashion, whether in Russia or the Soviet Union. I truly believe that whatever is hidden in the files is fascinating to an extent that when it comes available, if, if it ever does, it would change the course of history of our planet. But while some scour archives and documents, other UFO hunters explore well beyond the physical environment. A lot of people that investigate UFOs eventually uh, broaden their horizons, so to say. They get into metaphysics as well. Uh, I think they do that because they didn't get all the answers they wanted. And they feel that there's something bigger out there than the physical science that we've been dealing with. 
One such UFO hunter is John Rixey Moore. Throughout the 1990s, he traveled the globe investigating a phenomenon commonly associated with UFOs, crop circles. A fresh one definitely is a physiological experience. Uh, it's, it's something that makes your hair stand up. When you're walking in one, it's very interesting to note that normally the center of the vortex that formed it is not necessarily the center of the image, uh, the glyph. It's off-centered. If you walk with the lie of the plants, uh, you get the feeling that you're walking downhill. Uh, you can get going too fast. That's the sensation you get. When you turn around and walk against the lie of the plants, you have the, exa the exact opposite sensation. You become breathless. It feels like you're walking uphill. Some people uh, react so dramatically to them that they begin to get nauseous as they approach them. UFO hunter Ruben Uriarte has also experienced firsthand the physiological effects that Moore has encountered. Over the years that I've had the opportunity of walking into crop circles, I've noticed from a number of other people who are also in the formation sharing their bodily sensations, some of them feeling very dehydrated, some feeling nauseated. Sometimes I have, that, that has happened to me too, where I feel nausea. It's a sense the, that there's something, some sort of sensation that's going on with, with you. I'm a UFO hunter because I want to know what's going on. I want to know what's going on in this planet. I want to know what's, how it connects, how it affects us. And I want to solve the mystery. And through that, I'll do whatever it takes to get there. And that's why it's important for me to continue on this hunt for the truth. Is this video proof that aliens are inserting implants into humans? We looked and certainly there was a foreign body there which appeared to be metallic. Can this tiny object really be evidence of an alien abduction? <laughs> Nightmares. Strange recurring images. And missing time. UFO hunters say these are signs of alien abductions. Skeptics, on the other hand, argue these experiences can generally be explained by modern science. Still, much of what UFO hunters know about alleged alien abductions is based on eyewitness accounts. In some cases, however, there is evidence, but the abductee has no recollection of how it got there. At that point, UFO hunters, like certified hypnotherapist Barbara Lamb, stop looking outside the body and turn their search inward. Lamb uses hypnotic regression as a technique to help subjects recall and understand their experiences. Well, hypnotic regression is really a very simple thing to achieve. It's leading somebody into a nice state of deep relaxation. And in that state of deep relaxation, with the attention focused entirely on the inside, uh, the person is asked to go back to the source of whatever the subject is that they're interested in. The use of regressive hypnosis in the induction part of this mystery is a very necessary thing to do. It's a useful tool. If it's done correctly, it's very valuable. You have to know more about the human psyche to do that. Uh, Barbara Lamb is one of those people. I have regressed 480 different individuals. A person typically will come to me for hypnotic regression because they have a strong clue, or maybe several clues, that something very unusual has happened to them. Under regression, these abductees frequently describe terrifying interactions with aliens. There's a tremendous variety of experiences that people have with extraterrestrial beings. Those beings tend to do medical experiments on people, taking tissue samples, fluid samples, maybe taking hair samples, and in many cases they actually insert implants into the person who's having this experience. Physical evidence of implants exist inside the human body? 
UFO hunter Dr. Roger Lear takes the leap from the psychological world and studies the physical objects being extracted from the body. I am a UFO hunter, and my job is to pursue research in this very tiny slice of a very strange phenomenon. I've been a practicing podiatric surgeon for 41 years. I have uh, performed uh, research in a number of medical fields, and now I've applied uh, my skills in science to the alien abduction physical evidence phenomena. And one of the prime examples of this is the Tim Cullen story. May 30th, 1978. Tim Cullen and his wife Janet were driving north near Highway 59 in Colorado when they encountered what they believed was a UFO. Although they only recall staying at the scene for a few minutes, the Cullens arrived home an hour later than expected. Twenty years later, a routine x-ray revealed an unexplained piece of metal in Tim's arm. Cullen traced it back to that spring night in 1978. First contact was uh, just telling me who he was and that he thought he might be associated with the abduction phenomena and that he had uh, a metallic object in his arm. So we had him send the x-rays and we looked and certainly there was a foreign body there which appeared to be metallic. What you are seeing is the actual surgery which took place on February 5th, 2000. Do you get a hold of it? Dr. Lear supervised the procedure to remove the foreign object from Tim Cullen's arm. Although there was no original entry scar, a six millimeter metallic object was found under the skin. Once the object was removed, we find two very surprising things. One is that there's absolutely no inflammatory response by the body to the object, which is quote unquote impossible. And number two, we find that there's a large number of uh, nerve cells there that uh, really don't belong in that particular area. And these nerve cells are called proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are an active, living cluster of nerve endings. They are normally located in the hands and feet and respond to touch, temperature, and pressure. According to Dr. Lear, there is no medical explanation for them to be connected to a foreign piece of metal in the human body. When we look at what happens in the body after the object goes in, the body does not like uh, foreign things inside, so it reacts to it. Now, if it's, let's say, lead from a pencil or something like that, we get an immediate inflammatory reaction. But when we look at these things, there's nothing. Zip. Zero. So just from that alone, you can say these are drastically different uh, than any kind of uh, typical foreign body that we get inside. I believe that these nerve cells uh, are sort of the plug where this thing is plugged in at and it's using neural energy from the body to operate. On one case, uh, not Tim's, but on another case, we fortunately had a piece of equipment which was a radio frequency detector and we actually detected two oscillating frequencies that were being emitted from the object. When they are removed, they don't do anything. So obviously, uh, plugging them in somewhere into the body gives them some kind of energy that uh, makes them do whatever it is they do. Dr. Lear has supervised more than 10 of these operations. Each surgery has produced strange foreign objects from the body, all of which can be found safely locked in his personal archive. The evidence collected by Dr. Lear seems to defy scientific logic. We find that these objects contain metals which are not from this earth. The abundant amount of physical evidence available leads me to believe that this planet is being visited by intelligences from somewhere else. That is why I'm a UFO hunter. Coming up, UFO hunters put their evidence to the test and the results may surprise you. My job is to separate the outright hoaxes from the cases which uh, can't be explained. And is there a worldwide cover-up to hide the truth about UFOs? One government official finally tells his story from the inside. Pay attention. Listen up. This is going on.
Ultimately, validating the hard evidence accumulated by UFO hunters is just as important as recovering artifacts. Whether the substantiation comes from science, metaphysics, documentation, or imagery, UFO hunters will not risk their credibility by presenting false data. Since many UFO sightings are allegedly caught on film and video, attempts to verify or validate the images comes down to researchers like naval optical physicist Dr. Bruce McAbee. I'm a UFO hunter. My job is to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, to, uh, for example, in the photographic cases, to be able to separate the uh, cases which are mistakes or outright hoaxes from the cases which uh, can't be explained. Dr. McAbee has authored three dozen technical articles and more than a hundred UFO research papers over the last two and a half decades. I've known Bruce for over 30 years. I find that he is persistent, he is consistent, he is scientific, and he doesn't let opinions come in so much as science. In my opinion, Dr. Bruce McAbee is indeed a true UFO hunter. Dr. McAbee uses computer analysis systems to actually feed in and analyze each frame of a video, for instance, or to feed in a photograph. As a result, he has done investigations that stand the test of time. I have done not only photographic research, but also historical research into the subject of UFOs. Dr. McAbee is convinced that photos alone can't tell the entire story. He believes that the U.S. government is withholding vital information. I was one of the first people to try beating down the doors of the government by getting information out about the FBI. And J. Edgar Hoover himself says it is not now, nor was it ever was, the role of the FBI to be involved in UFO investigations. Dr. Bruce McAvee filed a Freedom of Information Act request. This is back in the 70s. Got 1,600 pages of material. When I got it and read through the documents, I could see that there was information in the FBI file that was nowhere else, including comments by Air Force people that were stored in the FBI file that you can't find in the Air Force file. UFO hunter Nick Redfern sifts through thousands of government documents from around the world to seek hidden information about these UFO claims. My background is largely uh, looking at things from an official level, trying to determine what has been learned about the subject, what has been uncovered by, for example, the British military, the British Royal Air Force, the Ministry of Defense, and over here, the Central Intelligence Agency, FBI, National Security Agency. What drives me to investigate UFOs is Basically, I think that at an official restricted level, there are people who know the truth about this particular subject. And I feel that if something so important and potentially mind-blowing and life-changing as visitors from another world actually coming here, I think that all of us have a right to know this. Based on my research, I'm convinced that UFOs are real, they're coming from somewhere else, and they're visiting us. And that's why I became a UFO researcher. But are there government officials who will admit to what they are hiding? When Nick Pope, an employee of the British Ministry of Defense, began exposing the ongoing UFO investigations within the British government, a crack in their wall of secrecy appeared. We got into it in 1950 um, on, on the basis of um, the fact that, that we were seeing UFO sightings in our country and that there was considerable public and media interest and interest from senior establishment figures. Pay attention, listen up, this is going on. We believe that the UFO phenomenon is real. The significance of an MOD employee actually coming out with a statement that they believe some UFOs are alien spacecraft I think is to really get across to the media and the public that these things are taken seriously at an official level and that there are people investigating these things. Dr. Robert Wood, former aerospace engineer and associate of J. Allen Hynek, analyzes documentation from the 1950s that alleges the existence of extraterrestrial visitation. Obviously controversial, these papers represent one of the most difficult tasks to UFO hunters, document authentication. When you attempt to determine a question document's validity, 
you approach this in an orderly manner. You, you, if you have an original, you do the things you can do, like look at the paper. If you don't, then you look at the shape of the letters, and you, you go into uh, the printing subtleties. Dr. Woods is one of the leading people in this field, uh, and, and the work he does in the forensic examination of documentation, I'd say he's probably the leading person. The documents that I've been exposed to include 4,000 pages of mostly unclassified material of somebody cleaning out his file drawer who used to work in some intelligence agency. But a lot of them, maybe 500 or 2,000 of the pages, are top secret. Some of those top secret files detail the Majestic 12 organization, a group allegedly established by President Truman to maintain the secrecy on extraterrestrials. Dr. Wood had the documents analyzed. I have taken those to a typewriter expert and have determined that they were typed on an Underwood 1940 typewriter, so it's consistent. Based on this analysis of the typewriter model, the paper and ink content, Dr. Wood believes the documents are genuine and may blow the lid off of a UFO cover-up. The large number of documents that I've been able to accumulate very clearly show that we have a covert program to keep from the public the recovery of a large number of crashes that include the recovery of extraterrestrials. Dr. Wood is definitely a UFO hunter. A good UFO hunter. But do you have what it takes to become a UFO hunter? The goal is to get the truth out there. Whatever it takes to do that, you've got to do it. Though UFO hunters are gaining visibility around the globe, they have a perceived PR problem. They're simply not taken seriously. Establishing credible standards for UFO investigation has fallen upon MUFON, the mutual UFO network based in Denver, Colorado. This is the largest scientific research organization on UFOs anywhere in the world. They have developed a program to train those interested in the field to do a thorough investigation. The job of the uh, investigator is not to express an opinion, not to influence witnesses, but basically to keep his mouth shut, listen to what they have to tell him, and put that together in some kind of meaningful form. And you have to have uh, some training to be able to approach the subject in the right way. How are you going to go about doing the investigation? The MUFON Field Investigator Training Program trains members of MUFON who wish to volunteer to become field investigators for the organization. Kathleen Martin is the director of MUFON's field investigation program and oversees the training and progress of over 1,000 UFO hunters across the nation. We currently have no formal government-sponsored organization that does this kind of work. And people feel that there is a real need for this kind of work to be done. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and Peter another... Jeremiah is one of the many trainers involved in the MUFON program and is skilled at determining who could cut it, who is serious-minded, and who should be weeded out from the ranks. My goal for teaching others to become certified is to try to get a quality investigator out there doing the work. I don't want to see true believers out there that every little thing that happens is a definite UFO. I don't want to see that happen. If they follow the investigator's manual and do the research the way they should, the unknowns will show up and the other cases will fall by the wayside. A verbal, my goal is to keep good quality investigators out in the field. You need to use your Bible when you're doing your investigation because this is where all the information is. Their Bible is the MUFON Field Investigators Manual. MUFON Field Investigators treat their UFO cases in the tradition of original UFO hunters like Dr. J. Allen Hynek and Dr. James McDonald. The organization has created a package of forms to help facilitate the documentation process and also a field investigators kit with specific tools for the right job. The equipment includes a tape recorder, compass, maps, and a camera. 
MUFON director John Schusler has a vision for the continued advances of MUFON. When a new investigator enters the field, he wants to make sure the level of credibility is maintained. We require all field investigators to study that and to take an exam to show they have been through it and they understand the way of doing things. This doesn't mean we limit how much they do in the field. What it means is we give them some criteria so when we get done, everybody's talking the same language. And then have them put it in writing. After the training is over, the UFO hunters head out into the field. So basically what happens is you'll get a report. First thing I do is call the witness, set up a meeting. I like to go to their place, you know, I like to talk to them face to face, not so much on the phone. We'll go out to the field with them. Just if they have any photographic evidence, like camcorders or, or still pictures or any of that, we take that under account. By the end, we'll, our main goal is to produce a summary, a report, which then goes to the National MUFON headquarters. Every year, MUFON investigates more than a thousand cases, of which 20% fall into the category of unexplained. We have some 300 consultants and research specialists in every possible field of endeavor that are able to look at this material. Those are scientists. And we go everything from astrophysics to religion. Back in the days when Dr. Heineck was doing this, he had an invisible college. These were people that were scientists that didn't want anybody to know they were doing it, but they would help him. Today we have a visible college that people are saying, I don't care, I'm going to look into it because I am a scientist. And that's truly what science is all about. I was speaking with Ann. With Information is discussed and debated at annual UFO conventions, like the National UFO Conference in Los Angeles, California. Cover up. I yeah. do believe UFO hunters come to conferences to learn more. 45. They're looking for answers to what maybe they've seen, maybe they've heard about, or maybe they're just curious about. So I believe that some of the attendees are UFO hunters. They're seeking out the truth for themselves. Symposiums, conferences, gatherings are always very important. I like to add that it's more the networking that's very important. It's important to hear what's the latest um, from the different researchers that are out there. But there's a lot behind the scenes and these conferences provide the avenue for people to get together and to share notes, to share what's going on. And believe me, I've learned more from behind the scenes uh, many times. Regardless of their reasons for investigating UFOs, these hunters have one common goal. I think it's definitely my job to tell the truth. And what is the truth? That is the prime goal, to find out what the truth is behind us. I think we are mature enough now uh, to take whatever the truth might be. The goal is to get the truth out there. Whatever it takes to do that, you've got to do it. As they look to the stars, the earth, or within the human body, UFO hunters feel their case is strong and the evidence irrefutable. As new technology, like the Hubble Space Telescope, identifies undiscovered Earth-like planets, one must wonder if the mysteries of the universe have, or ever will be, solved. But one fact remains. UFO hunters feel they are on to something big. These people, their testimony, could send a guy to the electric chair. And yet, they report a UFO and they're no longer credible. And that's a double standard in this country that uh, I simply can't understand. When someone says to me, uh, there's no physical evidence, I look at them uh, with a dismayed look and uh, would tell them that I'm very, very sorry for them. And they would say, why? And I would say, because you're so misinformed. The evidence is overwhelming in the form of large-scale scientific studies, physical trace cases, multiple witness radar visual sightings, uh, abduction cases. There's an enormous amount of data, and what I find is that the people who don't agree with me are people who haven't studied that data. I think we have seen through the UFO mystery the glimpse of the future. We're seeing devices in our atmosphere that operate in ways that we can't and haven't been able to operate. If we could harness any one of these, it'll change the future of humanity. And that's really why I'm in it. That's why I'm a UFO hunter.
Josh is heading for the glacial ranges of Patagonia to examine the remains of a vanished tribe of giants and to attempt to solve one of the greatest riddles of our time. The word Patagonia itself means big feet. Who knew? The giants of Patagonia on Digging for the Truth, next on the History Channel. That's huge. 